Okay, so let's wrap up our discussion about sleep by talking about different types of sleep disorders, of which there are certainly very many. Um, but one thing I actually want to say about sleep disorders before we talk about things like, you know, insomnia, hypersomnia, narcolepsy, and so forth, is actually that it turns out, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, that there is not a single psychiatric condition in which sleep patterns are normal. Schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, any psychological, psychiatric condition you can possibly think of, um, sleep has been shown to be altered by them. So for example, if we look at these here, I know these plots are very confusing, but let me just orient them to you. This up here is an individual who is a good sleeper. This is a person with chronic depression. Up here, the main thing I just want you to notice is this red section here is the uh, REM cycle, so red REM. Where, and then these yellow little uh, hiccups, those little lines are the person waking up. So you can see this person got a good night's sleep and had a, got a lot of REM cycle. This is a, a person who is, uh, you know, severely depressed, they wake up quite a bit and they have considerably less um, REM cycle. And so this is exactly the type of disturbance that you could see. And you see this with all sorts of different um, types of psychiatric conditions, such that literally there's not a, a single one that is not, that you could say has um, normal or typical sleep. Now, is it because of the dis disturbed sleep that the people have these problems or do these problems cause the disturbed sleep? It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. It's really complicated. There's not one single answer. Although I do know that there are a lot of labs that do work where they try to figure out ways to get people who have psychiatric problems better sleep to see if it would help them. Um, but for us, when we're talking about um, sleep disorders, we're going to talk about uh, several. This should say sleep disorders, not sleep deprivation. Well, but one of the first ones we're going to talk about is sleep deprivation. Um, but we're also going to talk about insomnia, hypersomnia, and narcolepsy. This is going to bug me unless I fix it. <laughs> Sorry. You all are getting to see me work in real time. Whatever. We're honest with each other here in cognitive neuroscience. All right, so let's start talking about uh, this first one, which is sleep deprivation, okay? Now, sleep deprivation is just basically when an individual doesn't get the amount of sleep that is, had been determined to be the kind of required amount or the recommended amount. And it turns out that this is, of course, not the same for everyone. So on here, on the vertical axis, we're looking at the hours of sleep. And down here on the horizontal axis, we're literally talking about newborns all the way to uh, older adults. And when we do that, we see something like this, where newborns are recommended to get, you know, somewhere between 14 to 17 hours of sleep. Um, much older adults only recommended to get seven to eight hours of sleep. How is this recommendation, de recommendation determined? It's just after years of observation, doctors have noticed that people who get more or less than these numbers that are in blue tend to be more likely to have certain health problems than people who don't. Um, so sleep deprivation would be considered um, potentially in these, I don't know, teal, aqua, green regions, um, but certainly in these yellow regions. If you're getting four or five, probably six hours of sleep a night um, for even individuals of your age, um, you would be considered um, to be sleep deprived. Now, sleep deprived, um, or sleep deprivation rather, is considered to be a relatively short-term problem. It's not a chronic condition. If you have chronic issues with sleep deprivation, that would be when we start to refer to it as something like insomnia. Um, so this is the sort of thing where it's like you do have the ability to sleep normally. It's just for other certain reasons you're not sleeping enough in the sh relative short term. It could be because you um, are you know, stressed. It could be because any number of different external factors. Who knows? And it can lead to a wide variety of problems mood problems such as irritability, um, attentional issues, memory issues, and so on and so forth. Um, and while it can have you know, detriments for sure, chronic deprivation of sleep, um, missing out on sleep for a wide period of time, that can certainly be far more serious than being temporarily sleep deprived. Um, and to give you a sense though about sleep deprivation and its relationship to mood, um, I thought I'd show you just a little bit from this one study um, related to the amygdala. Um, and it actually turns out that the amygdala, which if you remember, um, is this area that's involved in things like fear, anxiety, and so on and so forth. The amygdala, amygdala is more likely to be active um, when sleep deprived. So what you can actually see is that in sleep deprived individuals, um, they're more likely to have an active amygdala than they are if they were able to get um, a good night of sleep. And it is thought that this increased activation in the amygdala can also affect or can be affected by sleep because the connections between the frontal cortex um, decrease from the frontal cortex to the amygdala. Um, I didn't say that exactly right. 
the, the connections between the frontal cortex decreases and the frontal cortex is often thought to inhibit the amygdala. So the idea is that what happens is there is this re reduced connectivity from the frontal cortex to the amygdala with sleep loss. And since the frontal cortex can't inhibit the amygdala quite as much as it normally would, the amygdala will be more active. And when the amygdala is more active, you get more agitation, more anxiety and mood disorders and so on and so forth. Um, similarly, sleep deprivation has been shown to be uh, closely correlated with test scores. Um, so definitely pay attention to this part here. So here is a correlation between the average sleep duration for each one of these dots as an individual and the test score that they got. So you can see that individuals who got more sleep did better on average than individuals who did not get more sleep. Um, and then over here, now we're gonna be looking not at the uh, mean sleep duration, but the mean sleep standard deviation. So this basically is telling us like how consistent you are. So you could be getting eight hours of sleep every night, but that could, on average, but the, that could be a wide variance. There could be a big standard deviation. Sometimes it's six hours, sometimes it's 10 hours. You could also get eight hours of sleep a night and it'd be very small standard deviation. You're always between seven and a half and eight and a half hours. So this is showing the average amount of sleep, but this is showing how consistent you're getting the same amount of sleep. Um, and here, what you can see actually is um, the more consistent you are with your sleep patterns also, the the better your test scores are going to be. So there's a positive correlation with average and a negative correlation um, with the increase in standard deviation, which plays a role uh, for a lot of college students in particular because a lot of college students uh, are very inconsistent with sleep. You get five hours one night, you get nine hours on the weekend, so on and so forth. Um, this here is just to actually show you because there's so many different ways in which sleep affects your um, body as well where you can see just all together all the different types of effects that sleep deprivation can have. Um, you can have increases in things like mood disorders, we said, but also it can lead to memory lapses, cognitive impairment. You can have more muscle aches, decreased reaction time. Again, for you athletes out there, getting a good night's sleep certainly can help you um, perform better. You can have problems with your heart not being um, at a steady heart rate, your uh, immune system can be compromised. And this is why if anyone ever feels like they have a cold coming or the flu coming, um, they really wanna be really good about making sure that they get a lot of sleep. Um, and actually to get a sense of how quickly sleep deprivation effects can happen, actually we can look at uh, the, the, this fortunate opportunity with daylight savings time, because daylight savings time in effect is basically like a large scale sleep study, I mean with millions of people. Um, and so what you can do is you can look at literally the day before daylight savings time and the day after say like daylight savings time. Because in one season, you lose an hour of sleep, but in one season, you get an hour of sleep. And so it's basically just, you know, you have this nice control back and forth. And so what we can do is we can look at the number of car accidents on these given days. And blue is going to be the Monday before um, the time changes. And orange is going to be the Monday after the time changes. Oh, so I guess, is this the next day or is it a week? A week later? Maybe it's a week later. Regardless, so here on the left, it's gonna be the springtime change where you spring back, where you lose an hour of sleep. And what you can see is there's just a lot more car accidents. Whereas in the fall, when you, oh no, you spring forward, sorry, you spring forward and you fall back. So when in the fall, you get more sleep, there are fewer uh, car accidents. And so you can literally just see this nice rise and fall as a function of just giving people one more hour of sleep, just one more hour of sleep one time in the year can seems like it's on a globe, on like a national scale make a pretty big difference. Here actually is a plot, I really love this plot. Um, this was done back in Canada in the 90s. So it's the number of accidents in Canada across the different months, so this is the whole year. And what you actually can see are these two little dips, or I guess a dip and a peak. One is when an hour is lost, you can see there's more, this uptick in traffic accidents, and then another is when there's an hour gain, there's a decrease in accidents. And so even just one hour, one time, for daylight savings time can have this effect. But in addition for daylight savings times, besides car accidents, there's a lot of other things. It actually turns out that there are 24% more heart attacks after spring daylight savings time when an hour is lost. So you lose an hour of sleep, put some strain on your heart, there's more likely to have a heart attack. Um, whereas there are 21% fewer heart attacks after the fall daylight savings time when an hour is gained. Um, so even though it might seem like not a big deal to lose an hour or two here or there, it can definitely um, play a big role. But this is, of course, different from people who have insomnia because insomnia would be described as a consistent inability to fall or stay asleep. 
Um, people with insomnia have trouble falling asleep initially, and they have problems falling back to sleep whenever they wake up. They might get 30 minutes, but then they're, they wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, they're not able to go back to sleep for hours. Um, during the day, they are extraordinarily tired. Even if they you know, don't have an alarm, say on the weekends, and they really wanna catch up on sleep, um, and you know they're hoping to sleep to eight, nine, ten in the morning. They'll still wake up too early, um, and then, like I already said, they'll wake up you know multiple times, often in the middle of the night. Now, insomnia unfortunately can come from many different um, factors or many different things that can are there's just many different things that can cause insomnia. So, for example, it can be caused by mental health problems, stress. If you have chronic pain, of course, it's really hard to sleep if you have chronic pain. Um, there's a lot of associations between substance abuse, alcohol. Um, in other types of drugs and insomnia, thyroid problems, sleep apnea, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, insomnia is usually very hard to treat, and there are not that many um, medicines or that many drugs that are actually helpful. Um, there are some cases, though, actually, though, where um, there's medicines that can help, um, specifically when insomnia is caused by a deficient um, GABA system. So just to remind you, GABA is a neurotransmitter, and we talked about it uh, weeks and weeks ago, for example, when we talked about um, alcohol and how what alcohol does is that ethanol will um, uh, help the GABA system uh, work because what GABA does is GABA inhibits neurons, which is a fancy way of saying it prevents them from firing. And what alcohol will do is it will amplify these uh, inhibitory effects such that when you're sober, you can see your brain is firing on all cylinders, whereas when you're intoxicated, your brain activation dro drops quite a bit. Um, and so sometimes with insomnia and GABA, GABA, the GABA system isn't doing its job and it's not inhibiting the brain enough to put you to sleep. So if basically your GABA system isn't put, like inhibiting your brain to get you down for the night, there will be drugs that will kind of just help the GABA system inhibit the brain. Alcohol kind of does that because yeah, can alcohol can help you fall asleep, but alcohol has a lot of other elements to it that help you, that prevent you from staying asleep. So for example, the sugar that are in a lot of alcoholic beverages, once it gets processed a few hours later in the night, that can kind of give you a second jolt so you don't sleep as well. Um, also, it can dehydrate you, it's a diuretic, so on and so forth. Speaking of hydration, a sip of water. So there are certain uh, drugs, for example, benzodiazepines, um, which are themselves GABA agonists, and what they are intended to do is increase the effects of GABA. So here, this is a GABA receptor that's not working very well. And so there's not a ton of chloride getting in and chloride actually is uh, the ion that uh, helps inhibit the neuron itself. Um, but there's you know, a deficient GABA system. And so you can introduce benzodiazepines into it to kind of help this GABA system um, increase the flow of, of, chlor of yeah, chloride, which will help decrease the activation in the, in, in the brain, which can help insomnia. So, if you are fortunate enough to have insomnia because of a, a deficient GABA system, there are some drugs that actually can help you. Um, one thing I wanna say though about the extreme cases of insomnia is this condition called fatal familial insomnia. It is a, it is a terrible, terrible disorder. If I ever heard that one of you all, for example, got fatal, fami fatal familial insomnia, my heart would immediately break because your prognosis is terrible. Um, and it is largely thought to be caused by plaque building up in the thalamus. Um, and actually plaque building up in the thalamus or in the brain can cause a lot of different types of problems. It actually causes mad cow disease. You all might be too young to really remember what mad cow disease is. When we talk about Alzheimer's, again, it's often thought that Alzheimer's is linked to plaque building up. This plaque building up in the thalamus is basically like gunk in the engine in the system that prevents the neurons from firing um, accordingly. And once you get diagnosed with fatal familial insomnia, and once it's onset, um, your life expectancy is between seven and 36 months. So if you're lucky, you'll have about three years left. Um, fortunately, there are only about 30 families in the world that have it, and it is a genetic disorder. So for example, like if my, one of my parents had it and they had me, I would be walking my whole life being like, yeah, there might be a time later in my life where my fatal familial insomnia will kick in and you know, I will likely die a little bit. And so actually I know that there's like specials you can watch on YouTube where it's videos of the family members, the children in particular, getting interviewed talking about, you know, kind of like walking around with this like sword hanging over your head because you never know if it's going to drop. Um, sleeping pills, interestingly, for people who have fatal familial insomnia, you would think, oh, if these people have really bad insomnia and can't go to sleep and then eventually just pass away, give them sleeping pills, the sleeping pills actually don't um, help it 
um, they don't, it doesn't help them fall asleep. And in reality, it actually ends up shortening their life expectancy. Um, and it gets to a point, it's really rather tragic because you have people who are just completely delusional. They're totally exhausted. They can't sleep at all. They're losing weight very quickly. They become demented. Um, they become mute and so on and so forth. Um, and so here is just a short video of a guy um, who you can see is in the midst of fatal familial insomnia. And you can get a sense of what I mean about how when you lose um, the ability to fall asleep, your mind quickly goes as well. I just realized I wasn't sharing my computer sound. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Remember how I said we're doing this in real time. Try that one more time. Sharing computer. All right, now let's try. Sorry about that. There we go. We're running. Okay. Okay. How you feeling? Pretty good. This is a 42-year-old patient who presented for evaluation of extreme insomnia. He had only been able to sleep one to two hours a night for the previous six months. His family had noted his personality was more passive than normal. His wife reported that he was restless and fidgety and always seemed to be in movement. Over the last few weeks, his memory had begun to deteriorate. Okay, that's fine. Do you know where you are right now? Florida. Where? Florida. Okay, and what kind of place is this? House. This is a house? Well, this is a hospital. This is a hospital. Which hospital is this? You know, New Haven Hospital. Okay, and what state are you in? Connecticut. Okay. A minute ago you said you were in Florida. Do you remember that? Oh, I didn't know that. I know I said Yale New Haven, Yale New Haven Hospital. Yeah. Okay. What are you here for? Uh, to get my, my arm, a fixed or whatever it's going to be. Okay. What's wrong with your arm? Uh, I had a lot of pain when I was jumping into, uh, jumping into things. Mm -hmm. and it was kicking me back out. I see. Okay. What kind of work do you do? I am a maintainer three and i also am a uh, pirate okay I, I play a pirate for seven hours a day painting painting uh, lines and stories all through the middle of the woods interesting okay so you can really see it's really a tragic disorder there's no treatment this guy's pretty deep into it um, my guess is he probably doesn't have much longer because he's already so clearly fairly demented. Um, and so this is really the extreme end of how bad insomnia can be. But fortunately, it is extremely, extremely rare. Like I said, there's only about 30 families worldwide that seem to have the genetic mutation. Um, on the flip side of, of uh, a sleep disorder is a thing called uh, hypersomnia. And this is almost like you're sleeping too much. It's, it's oh gosh, sorry, excessive sleepiness. Um, and so in this case, you'll have actually people who seem like they just can't seem like they're getting enough sleep and they're even when they're sleeping quite a bit. Um, so they're frequently tired, so tired that they usually take multiple naps a day. Um, they're often even required for them to function if they, you know, they'll have to take a, lap, a nap in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the afternoon, maybe even when they get home, two, three, four naps a day, and they might still feel tired and they, but they need these naps if they're going to be able to function, be able to um, work or maintain a steady career or something. So it's not just that they're tired though from a lack of sleep, they're getting plenty of sleep. Um, it's just that even when they're getting say their full eight hours, they need more than that because they're uh, still excessively sleepy after that. Um, the only treatment that is known for people who have hypersomnia is a prescription stimulant, stimulant, stimulant called orexin. Um, and what ends up happening is that orexin is thought to just, you know, be a particular stimulant that seems to work well um, and kind of keeping them alert. Um, it's, a, it's not a stimulant that you really want to take recreationally. It's not as simple as like, oh, it's just a version of like a stronger cup of coffee. It has a lot of other complications to it. So it is a, a prescribed thing. You can't just get it recreationally. And even if you could get it, you know, on the black market, I would certainly not want to take it because I know it can have really downsides. Um, and hypersomnia is thought to be caused usually by damage to the pons and to the midbrain, because if you go back again early to the second week, we talked about how um, the pons and the midbrain, they work together to, uh, or the midbrain rather, works with the pons to help control sleep and levels of arousal. And so basically, if you don't have a properly functioning pons or midbrain, that's going to like have the natural you know, on off switch of you rising and falling in your sleep wake cycle, you're going to be, if it's turned off too much, you're gonna be sleep, sleepy all the time, even if you're getting plenty of sleep. 
Um, and then, is this the last one? Yeah, the last one we'll talk about is narcolepsy, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, so I'll just go very quickly. Um, narcolepsy is uh, an extreme form of extreme fatigue, and actually you'll even fall asleep without warning. Sometimes you'll fall asleep anytime, anywhere, without your um, control over it. Um, and sometimes when you fall asleep, if you're a narcoleptic, it can be a few minutes, but it can also be up to uh, about half an hour. Um, and even after you, you know, get some good sleep, you will quickly feel tired again right immediately after waking up. Um, now, one of the tall tale signs of narcolepsy is actually a subset of it, which is called cataplexy. Um, and this is where the muscles spontaneously go limp. Um, so this is not just when like you're sleeping that your muscles will go limp like this. You can actually find that people will sometimes be narcoleptic and they'll just be walking along and then kind of like immediately um, their muscles get, give out and they basically fall down um, and will, will fall asleep immediately. Um, what uh, a natural thing to wonder is what are the causes of narcolepsy? There's actually thought to be a couple of factors that are potentially at prey, play. One is low levels of a thing called hypocretin, which regulates wakefulness in healthy individuals. What is up with me? Why can't I pronounce words today? Um, so if you have low levels of hypocretin, um, it's, you basically don't have this chemical that's needed to regulate and monitor your wakefulness. And so without it to keep you awake, you can fall asleep very quickly and all, without, your, um, without any control over it. Also, you can have situations, this is, I mean, I guess not also, but usually these low levels of hypocretin can occur because of an autoimmune disorders that can attack the hypocretin producing cells. And so it's actually sometimes this autoimmune disorder will be leading to these particular sleep and narcoleptic problems. Um, and then also there are sometimes where it can be um, a genetic thing. There's a family history. It does run in, in the family sometimes, sometimes pretty rarely though. Um, I've heard it can come from brain damage to certain parts of the pons and midbrain and regions like that, but I think that's um, pretty, pretty darn rare. Um, and the last thing I thought we would do when talking about sleep is end with some tips about falling asleep, because these are just tips that I've kind of vetted as being you know, pretty scientifically valid. Um, so for example, here are 10 tips for uh, getting a better sleep. One, like we've talked about a little bit, is a consistent daily schedule. So it's better to sleep, you know, the same amount of day to hours, the same amount of time every day. That'll help you fall asleep and stay asleep better. Um, redu reduction of caffeine intake. God knows I am not always good about this and I drink coffee a little too late at night. Um, the computer and television has thought to play a really big role specifically because of the blue light. The blue light that actually is on most screens, specifically on Apple products, um, stimulate certain frequencies of sunlight. And so that sunlight, you know, and we were talking about with circadian rhythms, how external cues like the sun can affect your circadian rhythm. So if you are glued to your screens, your brain is getting this input that there is sunlight around you even when there's not. So your body will not be getting the cues that it's time to go to sleep because your body and your brain specifically are, are misinterpreting this blue light as being part of the sun, which in reality, when in reality it's coming from your computer or television. Um, Going to bed on a full stomach or an empty stomach can make it hard to have good sleep. Um, also, beverage consumption before bed can make it hard to have good sleep. Um, and then there's some you know, more basic things like keep your bedroom dark and quiet. Um, and then, <laughs> I love this, invest in a uh, comfortable mattress and pillow and bedding. Make sure you're not you know, in a weird position. Um, and then go to sleep uh, and wake up using your internal alarm clock if you have the luxury of you know, being able to fall asleep naturally um, and waking up at a natural hour to function. That's off, you know, the best way to do it. You'll be the most rested and energetic. Uh, if you're anything like most people, though, you need to set alarm to get to class and stuff. I, I, I know I mentioned smartphones a little bit um, when I was talking about point three, but I just want to talk about it a little bit more in depth because it just, it's a thing that I think is re related to so many of us. Um, and just to reinforce these ideas is that um, smartphone light or computer lights also uh, really ruins sleep schedules and this leads to all sorts of health problems. Um, over the long term, not getting enough sleep leads to buildups of neurotoxins, which makes it harder to get sleep. A poor night's sleep um, caused by the smartphone's light can make it harder to learn the next day. So, you know, we talked about the studies with your hippocampus. So if you're not getting enough sleep, um, it's going to be harder to learn or go to class or study. Um, it can impair your memory, so it can impair your ability to, to, to learn those new things. Um, it actually can, um, it's been shown, has been playing a role in obes obesity and that people who are having these sleep problems, a lot of times attributed to their uh, smartphone devices or to their uh, 
computers are at a higher risk for obesity, and they're at a higher risk for depression, um, higher risk for breast, breast, uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer. They're more likely to get cataracts because they're spending so much time looking at these devices. Um, and overall can damage your vision and, and or make it worse overall. So really, please, please, please focus on your sleep, take care of your sleep. It leads to better grades, it leads to better learning, it improves your memory. For those of you who are you know, stressing out about your grades, which is if you're anything like I was in college, you were stressed out about grades, it improves, improves your mental health. Um, one of the best things that people can do for improving their anxiety, their depression, is getting better sleep. It improves your physical health if you're dealing with injuries or just maintaining um, physical health throughout your life. And again, for those athletes out there, it really can help you with physical performance. So it's really in your best interest to get a good night's sleep. Um, and I just really can't stress, there are so many nights where I wish I could be around to tell students, like to be the little you know, angel on your shoulder telling them like, it's two in the morning, go to sleep. I know you've got the test tomorrow, but you're gonna do better on it if you're well rested. Um, but I know that's a counterintuitive thought. Um, all right, so let's stop there. And then when we come back, we'll actually switch gears and talk about anesthesia in the brain.